This is the generative commons call on Wednesday, August 18th, 2021. Um, yeah, and I'm, gosh, I'm wondering where Sebastian Hessinger has gone because I was asking him to see if he might join us for these calls. And who is Sebastian? He is an old and dear friend who is with IBM now, and his role at IBM is remarkably close to what Generative Commons is trying to do. Oh, wow. I know, and I had a catch-up call with him a couple weeks ago, and we're like, oh my God, you need to show up here. I gave up what I was doing, by the way. I can't, oh wait, maybe it's this? No, that's, I gave up, <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> Sorry about that. Let's see, let me add the link to our Zoom to him. Bump, 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 there we go. Uh, hey, Hank. Hey, Hank, we haven't uh, started. Hello, Jerry, hello, Stacy. We haven't started well, generating the generative comments yet. We're just uh, troubleshooting. Yes, good. I like, your, I like your background. That's very, that's a lovely print. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> I like lighthouses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One of my favorite iconic uh, things in, in the world. <laughs> so yesterday, randomly in conversation, or uh, yesterday evening at an event I was at, a woman randomly said, yes, you could get, uh, paintings of lighthouses, and then there's a painter famous for painting lighthouses. And she mentioned his name, and I don't, I don't remember that. I'll, I'll look him up. Yeah, yeah, good. I know there, there is a painter who did a lot of lighthouses, but I can't come up with the name. Yeah, good. And what's that in your background? Is that an this atoll is, in the South Seas? This is the Moana Island from the movie Moana, from the Disney movie Moana. Aha, uh -huh. oh no. I don't Thomas know Kincaid. Nope. So no, Thomas Kincaid, who um, let's see if I can find his Wikipedia page or some art. Thomas Kincaid, the official website, painter of light. Well, ha, the painter of light is not this one, but uh, but here we go. Um, and let's get uh, images. There we go. A painter of, of American Americana kind of paintings. Okay. So, and I'm yeah. not seeing not seeing that many lighthouses in uh, in the first. Uh, all I did was search for Kincaid and then switch to images. Uh, now, if I say lighthouse, now I get oh, of course. Let me just uh, screen share real quick. Uh, so I, I added the word lighthouse, and here are ah, a bunch of yeah. Thomas Kincaid lighthouse scenes which are a little bit fantasy romantic, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, he has a whole, and then if I, if I back up to the first one, you'll see what his normal sort of image repertory is. He does, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. he makes, he makes uh, rural sort of town scenes look like they're coming out of the movie, The Hobbit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, so, um, I did, don't have a I don't have a plot for our conversation about the generative commons for today, um, but we've done pretty well just kind of being open to what shows up in the calls and going with it. Right. Um, I'm so I'm wondering me. if either of you uh, want to take a uh, shine a flashlight into the generative commons topic in whatever direction you'd like. Well, I have a language question that I want to ask. Um, it regards the word skins that I learned yesterday. Yep. So I want to know if I if that word could be appropriated to describe a theme. Like I mentioned that I was working on something and my theme is sort of everything that you, you know, everything you needed to know you learned in kindergarten, here's what you missed. And it's sort of like a Mr. Rogers type thing. Could that be called a skin? So kind of, sort of. Now, theme, you threw that word in here as well, and theme has a specialized meaning here too, uh, when it's used to mean something like skin. So if you install WordPress, 
you then get to choose through word, hundreds and thousands of WordPress themes, which will make your WordPress site look like something or something else. And the theme will include what is the arrangement of things on the, on the web page, uh, what kind of links do you have? It's everything. Sometimes the theme includes, usually the theme I think includes fonts. So, the, so a theme is kind of a unified package for a look and feel of a site. So looking at it from that perspective, and a skin is kind of a simpler theme. Uh, skins, I think, got, got popular, maybe not. Uh, so if you remember the Napster app, um, mm -hmm. back when we were downloading you... music like crazy off the website, off, off the web, right? Um, so Napster had skins, and, and it probably is earlier than that. We could look it up on, of course, the Wikipedia, the holder of all knowledge. Um, but basically for Napster, it was just like a different look and feel for what the little music player interface looked like. And it might look retro, retro futurist or Afro modernist, or like, you know, you could, you could basically pick from a couple different skins to change the look of it. So given that, and given a kindergarten or Mr. Rogers theme, you could in fact skin or theme a website or an app to look a little bit like Mr. Rogers set or the castle or... Yeah, uh, I meant more figuratively. So I guess skin is the outside, what it looks like. And I'm looking for a word that reflects the inside. Which is why it's called a skin, by the way, and not a skeleton or a, you know, uh, or, or whatever else, or, you know, the bones of something or the inside, the structure of something. So it's very so much- want flesh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you want the flesh and the soul. Uh, yeah, so, so skin and theme aren't quite exactly what you're looking for, I think. Thank you. But they can be helpful because, because you could imagine easily uh, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood theme for a website. And, you know, you can imagine what characters would, would, would linger in there and what some of the background would look like and the theme music because he composed so much music in his life. Have you watched the documentary about him? Um, I think I saw parts of it. But here, here's the funny thing. Yeah. I hated Mr. Rogers as really? a kid. I really? really did. It was boring. I, it, but I understand now why. Because yeah. I kind of got it. <laughs> And I, it was, <laughs> and I didn't grow up with. I grew up in South America, so I didn't grow up with any children's TV other than some brutal cartoons. Uh, that was that was about <laughs> it, right? I, I I didn't get Sesame Street. Sesame Street is much later. Mister Rogers, I didn't get uh, none of that. Um, but April had a hard time with her mom in her in her childhood, and for her, Mister Rogers was really significant. Mm. And April didn't feel very you know very loved by her, and 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 the idea that you're you're fine just the way you are was really anchoring and we watched the documentary together and it really moved her she was like wow and i and i hadn't realized what a role this had played for her uh growing up so that was really interesting for me that's what um, i'm really what, interested what in. type of documentary is that it's a uh, it's called uh won't you be my neighbor i think let me look it up um, i believe it is and i did see it and... so uh, <laughs> Did not Mr. Rogers. Grow up with Mr. Rogers, don't even know who Mr. Rogers is, but really oh, sounds like I should know. You yes. have <laughs> you have some fun things coming. Um, so it is called Won't You Be My Neighbor? I'll put a link to it in the chat and yeah. and I'll put a link to Mr. Rogers in my brain in the chat. <laughs> uh, but, but there's the Wikipedia page, and then uh, there's a I've got under uh, Mr. Rogers, you'll find a, a bunch of uh, YouTube videos that are different aspects of it, including, I think, yeah. a couple of clips from the documentary. But one of the one of the really interesting things in the documentary is that um, Fred Rogers uh, believed in equality. And this is the civil rights era when he's doing these things. And so at one point he has a police, a police care. No, the mailman, not the policeman. Right. The mailman character mailman. Is, is, is black. And he invites the mailman to, it's a hot day on the set. They're pretending it's a hot day. He invites the mailman to take off his shoes and put his feet in the same small little, uh, you know, inflatable pool uh, that Mr. Rogers has his feet in and treats him completely as an equal. And, and it's like, this is an era where these things are, are very fraught. Um, and he does this wonderful, gentle, sort of uh, friendly thing uh, on set. And, and that's one of many kinds of things that Mr. Rogers was busy sort of quietly doing um, as he went about his business. And I you know, didn't realize the, how profound that was. And then separately from that, I watched a video a documentary about Sesame Street. Uh, mm. It's called Street Gang. I'll, I'll put a link to Street, Street yeah. Gang. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, I'll put a link to Street Gang in the chat as well. Street Gang, how we got to Sesame Street, which... Um, I, which moved me a lot 
uh, because it was um, because a friend of mine, um, this will be a funny sort of story, I think. A friend of mine took me out to lunch in 1998 when I went off on my own. And uh, he told me the story of uh, Jim Henson and Lloyd Morissette. Um, and so, and, and I'm going to, I'm going to kind of, I haven't updated the way I tell this story for having watched the documentary. So I should do that. But Jim Henson was basically a busker, a pu pu puppeteer busking on the streets of San Francisco. Uh, occasionally he'd get like a local channel TV show or something, and then there'd be the odd puppet festival, but he was barely making a living, you know, doing puppetry. And he invented this, he had already invented Kermit and a couple other characters. So you could tell he like there was something there. And then he runs into Lloyd Morissette and Joan Gantz, who later becomes Joan Gantz Cooney. And those two basically say, hey, you're a really good puppeteer. We could build something around you. And the existence of the Muppets, Sesame Street, Children's Theater Workshop, and everything else around it comes out of them yeah. having yeah. sort of built stuff. And what, what my friend David was telling me over this lunch was, you need to find your Lloyd Morissette. <laughs> because you're good at, some, at, the, at the stuff you're doing, but you're not good at selling business. Blah, blah, blah. And, and in some weird way, I've been looking for my Lloyd Morissette since 98 with, with a little success. And, and in some sense, OGM is a way of crowdsourcing some of that, right? Yeah. Like, like yeah. hopefully some people will show up who'd like to build parts of this. And what we haven't figured out yet, what we really haven't figured out yet is how to actually frame up projects and how to actually get people to go spend a bunch of time on the project, how even to fund some of these projects, which is yeah. what, I'm trying, what I'm trying to pitch for right now. Yeah. Um, and then just to tie this back to the topic at hand, um, and how to have all these projects feed the commons, yeah, right? So that as we build materials, uh, we are sharing them with each other. And I had a really interesting conversation last night with a couple people from a, a large packaged goods re manufacturer and, and vendor uh, about, they, first I was showing them my brain and they were like, whoa, man. And then I was like, wouldn't it be interesting if we sort of curated one of these collectively and in, in, in whatever tool made sense for you, but if, if when you improved something about Sesame Street, it was improved for my view and my visit to the information as well. And they're like, yeah, and that could change how education is done, how voting and governance happen, how corporate strategy is made. And we'd sort of be talking through this shared memory and their eyes lit up. They were like, yeah, that sounds really interesting. I'm like, all right, how do we do that? How do we inspire, you know, uh, well, partly what that means is that companies as they collect and create information would need to share a lot of it. And they're completely unaccustomed to that. They're busy, they're busy putting up higher walls uh, to defend the castle, right? And, and partly what we're saying here is that uh, you don't really, if you think living in a fortification is going to save you or help you, you're wrong. You actually need to live in a village with like, like palisades and be, you know, be peers in the estuary, making things fruitful for everybody. I mean, I, I'm very inspired by the books I read just in the last few years about North and South America and Australia being managed landscapes, like mm. really inspired by them. And, and, and it makes complete sense. Like in Australia, there's a weir. A weir is a, is a, a trap in a river. Uh, so basically you set big stones in a river uh, that stick a little bit out of the water and you don't have to close the weir. Like, like, so there's a weir that's in, a, in the Barrowana or something like that river in Australia that's possibly 20,000 years old. They, they can't date it, it's really hard to date. But what would happen would be you put stones in the river and then um, you put them close enough that a fish cannot escape, you know, a, a mature fish can't make it, make it through the stones, but the water goes through no problem then when you know that the fish are going to run because the fish run seasonally and there's a, there's a timing to it, you take everybody, you take the family and the tribe basically over and you camp next to the river. You then put the stones off to close the bottom of the weir and you wait for the fish to run. And the fish fill your weir and you just go there and you reach in and you take the fish out and you dry them, salt them, smoke them, do whatever you're gonna to do to save a lot of protein very, very inexpensively and easily. And if, and if you understand what happens when, and you can just pass that down through stories like song lines, you're on your way. And, and there's, there's a lot of cheap protein. And, and once you figure out salting, smoking, or drying, you, you can carry the stuff around for a while or hide it or do whatever else, right? Yeah. Um, 
Uh, and so, and that's just one of the things. Another thing is you plant, you, you find a forest that's got a bunch of game that you like, and then you plant something that those animals like to eat right next to the forest and you just go away. You just, you just sow a lot of the stuff near the forest. And then you go away for the, for a year and come back. And then the animals are out grazing and you like, you cull the herd, you, you pluck some of them to eat from. And, and, and you do other kinds of things with controlled fire, uh, fire stick farming or whatever, whatever you want to call it. But with controlled burns, you actually manage the undergrowth and everything else that's around. And then after a controlled burn, you would plant something that you wanted to see in that area. You would do all other kinds of things. So when the first fleet, the British first fleet shows up in Australia and you read their journals, and this is from the book, The Biggest Estate, I think it's called, or the greatest estate or the biggest estate, I'll look it up. Uh, so you read the journals of the first fleet uh, gentlemen who land and their comments are, Australia is like a gentleman's garden. You ride your horse through the trees, it's clear. You reach up, there's an apple, you look down, there's a gourd. This is a marvel. And they think this is just how nature works in Australia. They attribute none of this to local intelligence or care. Mm, None mm, of it. They think the locals are lazy and stupid heathens, even though this is among the oldest civilizations on the planet. Yeah. Right? And they proceed then to destroy the civilization. And another little light bulb went off. And they bring sheep because they realize, oh, this is a terrific landscape. Our sheep will grow fat and happy. We can, we can start to finance Australia by selling wool from here. Isn't that great? And then they let the sheep graze wild across the countryside and the sheep eat up the sheep eat up this whole manicured landscape. Yeah. The sheep are like, thank you so much. And they go run rampant and destroy all of this. Not all of it, but progressively. They just sort of eat up the place. And you're like, ah, oh, crap. Right? Because when, when you're managing the, the, the when you manage animals and plants well, so one of the thoughts in my brain says, humans who know what they're doing are really good for the land. Yeah. You want smart humans on the land everywhere because they make the land better. They increase soil fertility, which would make Klaus happy and maybe save our planet, you know, a whole bunch of other things. Humans are good for the land, who own, but only those who know what they're doing. And the, the idiot humans who are busy building a, a house in the middle of a forest that is kindling, and then like, you know, worried when it burns down, like that was not a, that was probably not a good place to build a house, right? Um, but you could camp there. And, and April and I had a homestay trip. <clears throat> we had a, a conference to attend in Beijing. And we were like, oh, okay, we've been to Beijing together. What else could we do? And April booked us a, a, a homestay trip in Mongolia. And we went to Ulaanbaatar for a few days, which was awesome. And then we, we took a, a little microbus out, way out onto the steppe and stayed with three or four different families and learned that to this, to this, so half the population of Mongolia, which is three million strong, half the population lives in Ulaanbaatar. The other half is out on the steppe, in the in the thinnest populated place on earth, other than Greenland. Um, and they move three times a year. So all these families pick up and move their gurs, and the gurs are the are yurts, are basically round homes that you can break down in a couple hours, pack up, and move. They move three times a year. So they have winter quarters up in up toward the mountains, and I, I don't remember what else is happening. But when they move, for example, they leave their horses behind. And the horses will take care of themselves. And they can find their way back. And they do all these interesting little tricks. There's no fences out on the step. Like no fences. In fact, yeah, you know, the roads are really full of potholes. So when you travel out, you're busy dodging potholes. And there's sometimes parallel roadways that are just kind of like other people mm -hmm. just gave up on the road because it was so full of potholes. So there's pothole little paths next to the road. And there's every now and then you have to stop because there's a bunch of goats crossing the road um, and that's what they're gonna do. Uh, but it's super interesting how all these things coexist. Anyway, it was, it was, easy, it was easy to envision Mongol horde. And then the Mongol invasions worked really well as long as they were on step. If they were on open step, they could like take you over because they could, they knew how to live on that easily. You start to get into crowd, you know, crowded mountainous terrain, you start to get into thick forests and their logistics start to go haywire. Um, and, and the last little piece of that, the, the thing they drink a lot is um, fermented mare's milk. They, yeah. have, they have cows, camels, horses, sheep, and goats, all of which produce milk. The milk they drink 
is fermented mare's milk. They milk yeah. their horses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't even know. For, and then they ferment it because fermentation um, mm. uh, uh, pr uh, preserves the nutrients and uh, preserves the milk. So you can have yep. an open, you can have an open tub of Arag is what it's called, and it won't spoil. It's fermented. It's good. Did and you taste it? It's good for you. And when you visit a gur, the first thing that happens is the older male of the incoming visiting visitors, that being but. that being me, gets gets offered a bowl of Arag to drink from. And so you get, to, and, and they warn you, don't drink too much of it. It's a really good diuretic. Uh, it'll, it'll, it'll give you the, the shits. Um, but you have, have you some. had it, Jerry? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I drank some. It's like a kefir or a spicy uh, yeah, yogurt yeah. or whatever. Yeah. You know, that, that's, that's kind of what it's like. Yeah. Um, but it's really nutritious. Um, and they, you know, they'll drink a half bowl, no problem. Just bloop, bloop, bloop. Just, yeah. just come in off hard work on the step and you drink some Arag. And then the reason I brought it up is, you can progressively dry it and cook it, but I think as you dry it down, it turns into the world's first cliff bar. And so <laughs> this, this, this little, it looks like a fudge or toffee, kind of a, a cake like a centimeter and a half or an inch thick, um, and you can break it up, it's hard, um, and it's just protein. It's just like protein. And you can imagine slipping that into your robe or your pocket or your bag and going a really long distance. So, so this was like portable, rations, you know, Napoleon had big, you know, margarine and canned foods were invented for Napoleon's armies. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because he had to feed his armies on the hoof. And they, you know, one of the ways that Napoleon beat his enemies was they didn't have a long supply chain with all kinds of kitchen, you know, kitchen trucks and food stuff happening. The, you know, everybody kind of ate where you were and you had to pilfer the local villages or fields or whatever for food. Um, but they invented canning for, to, 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 to keep the army moving. Um, so you don't have canning in the days of Mongols, not on, not on the horizon. So you've got, you know, dried Arak. <laughs> um, anyway, sorry for all the stories. Um, but how do we, how do we get everybody to start seeing that we're all like sharing space? And if we shared space more intelligently, we could actually do a lot of really good stuff. It's yeah. A pretty, it's a pretty simple a pretty simple thing. We've managed to, the idea of ownership, uh, which is part of capitalism and all that, has managed to eat everything. It's managed to just eat our brains. Um, one of the reasons I really like the book, The Great Transformation by Polanyi, and it, have you have either of you heard me mention it before? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I bring it up a lot. One of the reasons I love it is that it describes how we used to live together before the Industrial Revolution. And people used to share a bunch of stuff. Like when, when, when the neighbors down the street slaughtered the pig, a bunch of people got to eat some pork. And then, then you salted or smoked some of it and, and saved some of it. But, but we did a whole bunch of sharing. And then capitalism wants all of that territory. It doesn't want anybody living on the, the land for sheep. And so it pushes them off the land. So they no longer have a lot of room for a plot in the backyard, <coughs> et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, and there's a bunch of really interesting cross stories here, like the history of the potato intersects there. Because um, the potato is not, a, is not a thing in Europe until Col after Columbus, right? The potato is native to the Americas only, to Mesoamerica, to the Incas. Um, there's no potatoes anywhere. There's no hot peppers in China before they cross the Pacific. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no hot peppers in China. Don't have hot peppers. And now it's like, you can't imagine the Sichuan cuisine without hot peppers, but no hot peppers. Um, so the potato is actually really nutritious. Yep. It's, it's very nutritious because uh, it absorbs a lot of minerals in the earth. Um, and then there's a whole history of trying to convince Europeans to eat potatoes because they wouldn't. Yeah. They refused. And um, kings had to resort to trickery uh, in order to get people to like potatoes. Uh, and then they became dependent on potatoes. And then there was a potato blight that destroyed the potato crop across Europe within three or four months. Yeah. And the Irish were so dependent on potatoes that they starved. Or immigrated. Yeah, starved and many of them had just were forced to leave. So you have yeah. then a huge Irish immigration into the US where yeah. they're treated as horrible people. Like, like in, in America always, the most recent wave of yeah. immigrants is treated like shit. Yeah. You know, whether it was Italians or Irish or whatever, 
we called them terrible things. We thought they were lazy and stupid and you know, it was bad. Um, but that's our pattern. So anyway, so partly I wanna figure out what does a medium look like that makes this kind of storytelling easy? And then um, where we can overlay and contrast and improve our stories. Because I, 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 I had a moment some years ago, I met a guy who loved history and we started telling some of these stories. And I was, I was telling a story about how the Mongols uh, bounced off the Great Wall of China. First, um, well, later they conquered China and you have the, the, the whole Yuan empire in China. Yeah. But, but before that, the Chinese built this wall to keep the damn Mongols out. And the Mongols basically bounce and start going over and invading Europe. So the European invasions are partly a result of the Chinese, of the Great Wall of China. Who knew that? Um, but then this other fellow started saying, oh yeah, and then this, and then this, and then this, yeah. stuff that I don't remember right now because I was standing instead of say, sitting in front of my brain in a browser. <laughs> and stuff that, that was his worldview about how things evolved. And it, yeah. was, it was fascinating and great. And I sat there thinking, okay, I wish I could swiftly weave <clears> these <throat> things together into a view of history that, that made sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. There are a couple of those, <clears throat> but yeah, now I have to think of the titles. Maybe I can dredge up uh, references. Uh, uh, history as told by the losers or something like well, that. Well, that's uh, uh, Howard Zinn's The People's History of the United States is exactly yeah, that. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yep. And and uh, I think there, there are one or two more. And uh, an it's very, very history. nice to get them back into the uh, front of attention of, of people these days. Yeah. Yes, exactly, exactly. And, and partly that's what I'm trying to do. So I have this unproduced video uh, my story of trust, my history of trust, which is just my talking head. And I, I, meant to, I meant to sort of unpack it, turn it into a series of better produced videos, et cetera. I haven't done that, but I wish everybody, I, that, and that's just my own version of history, but I like it a lot. It, it explains a whole bunch of stuff, like how yeah. colonialism really fucked up the world and why decolonization actually might matter, right? Um, and why, all those people we've been treating as heathens might actually deserve respect and equality and, uh, and everything else. And uh, what a hard time they've had and how systematically the systems have been designed against them because that's what you do when you win. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so and just to leap over a couple of thoughts, but how do, how do white supremacists in the United States say that America is for white people? Like how, how can they say that with a straight face, given any notion of history? Like, really, what's up there? Uh, it's just not credible on any, uh, on, unless you just think, hey, we invaded, we captured the place, it's ours now, uh, or whatever. I don't know. Things like that make no sense to me. And to, you know, to make a, to make a claim like that and and rest your heart on it and, and, and attack and hate other people for it just is like not sensible. But then a lot of these things are not about sense, <laughs> right? Yeah, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to sound anywhere close to making excuses for white supremacists, but I do want to answer your question. Please. I believe that what they're thinking before it gets to the hate part, it's we want our own culture don't make us mix cultures right that that's the short yeah. answer <laughs> yeah. crazy and, but. And, but they also seem to feel like they're being persecuted for their culture and i can see how that becomes a narrative because nobody's actually trying to stamp out white european culture as it sort of got transmuted in the u.s nobody's actually i don't see anyone actively trying to get rid of it or doing something to it or <clears throat> and then it's a very syncretic culture so Elvis Presley gets famous for taking black music and making it, you know, palatable to white people. Interesting, yep. right? Gets really famous for doing that. Interesting. Uh, and, and there's a whole bunch of other weird things that happen in the middle of all that. But, but, but there's this idea and the, the, the census uh, early data was released just, I think, last week 
and shows that there's a big decline in white Americans. So the, 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 number, the, the percentage of America that considers itself sort of Caucasian or white is going away. Some part of that drop may in fact be uh, because a lot of people are just answering with better, with more detail that they're not white, but they're this other ethnicity. Um, and those same people in the previous census might have checked uh, Caucasian or something like that. I don't know, um, but it's but but there's this whole white replacement uh, argument that says that the plot from the left, which wants free immigration, is to just outnumber the white people in America and to turn this country into something else entirely. <clears throat> and I'm like. <laughs> I, I hear you, I have little or no sympathy for this. <coughs> Nobody's really trying to chase you off. And these are just awesome people. And why don't you go have some of their food? Like go, go figure out, yeah. Um, and Zinn is, that's a great book. That's a, just taking the perspective of the losers is really interesting. I um, just of, downloaded it. You oh, can cool. download this following a link, 622 pages. Yeah. Let me try to get the link into It's a the... great book. It's a great book. Um, oh, I was just going to say something, but I've lost it. So what does all this mean for the generative commons and for any agreements to work? And Stacey, I saw that you put a link to your Google Doc. Is that for the story you're writing or no, what piece it's is not. It's, it's for the answer, my best answer to oh, your question. Which you didn't finish answering. Which is how do we get how do we get people to want to contribute to that? And when you read that, you'll see that one of the things that actually gets created is sort of like a TV station. And that would mean that there might be a group of writers that want to take your trust series and break that apart and create their own show out of it, which would then be scheduled in that. And is that is that is what you're saying harmonious with what I've been saying about weaving the world as a show? Oh, abs absolutely. But absolutely. There's one slight difference, though, because the idea is so the OGM gets this funding to give out. And so if you read, well, you know what you read, you'll read it and then you'll decide. But um, yeah, we'll talk more about it after. Uh, you read it. I just I have to request it, access. Yeah. And you, you need to give me access. Oh, I don't... So I requested access. I don't know how that works, but I'm thinking I'm going to get an email that's going to. I say... would assume it's a, an email. email. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Google should alert you that. Yeah. That you are wanted for that. Yeah. Good. I got. Yes, I got it. Perfect. Okay. Good. Cool. So if you change the settings or just approve us individually, we should be able to see yeah. it. Yeah, I like to approve individually because, yeah. as I told Pete. Um, well, a couple of reasons, but also I, I only want to, if somebody's not interested, I don't, you know, I, I want to know who actually wants to read it. Okay, mm -hmm. so you both yeah. have this. Yep, yeah, all set. Thank you. Thank you. So let, let me uh, pose, uh, no, it's, I don't know what I'm posing, not a question, but it's sort of a question. Mm -hmm. uh, this whole idea of the generative commons or generative innovation commons, or the way I sometimes translated it before I met OGM, uh, distributed uh, uh, living lab or global lab for societal innovation, now I'm starting to call it the uh, mission lab for, uh, for SDGs. Uh, so I am a part of, um, let's see, uh, a federation, a club, a... League? Uh, Are you a, part of the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen? Not yet. I don't think I'm, I'm, sort of I don't surprised. Think I'm a gentleman. I, I used to characterize myself as, as an obnoxious, but anyway, but I don't think I'm a gentleman. Uh, well, I'm a, I'm a member of the World uh, Futures Studies Federation of the New Club of Paris, uh, set up by, among, by Leif Edmondson, among other things. I'm not a member, but I uh, correspond regularly with the board of. Uh, of directors of the European Network of Living Labs. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I'm now part of OGM, which is either a mindset, a church, or different things that Michael uh, put into the 
uh, put into the matter most a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And each of them has the potential of being a kind of mission lab or distributed global lab. Uh, and I don't know exactly how, let me put this in the chat as well. Should actually do it in Mattermost, but I can do that later. Um, OGM, I've mentioned it to you, Jerry. Uh, how how to do something like that? It's a, an ongoing theme of a of a conversation sometimes. For the World Federation of Future Studies, I'm going to do a workshop about this uh, at their global summit in Berlin in October. Uh, for the new club of Paris, I am proposing it to the events commission, which I've now become part of in a conversation next week. Uh, and for the ENOL, I've done two presentations about it at the two most recent uh, uh, digital living lab days. And people are interested in it, but they don't, know how to go somewhere with it. And I've also uh, drafted an article with three uh, pleasantly disturbed uh, French people uh, in, the last, uh, in the last month, and we're going to look for some sort of publishing for that. Mm -hmm. So it's starting to come together. Uh, I would love to do an experiment where two or ideally three of these groups try to do it and just afterwards reflected on what they learned, what worked, what didn't work, put it together and then we'd know a lot more. I like that. Yeah. Oh. Um, uh, and, and, and how to do this, how to reflect. And I'm sitting here thinking about, I'm gonna overgeneralize here. So uh, my apologies ahead of time, but a lot of a lot of convenings of senior people um, are sort of technologically limited in the sense of they totally know what books are, and yep. books are of extremely high value. And sometimes they publish books or big white papers or whatever. Done. Yep. They also know how to make policy and what what sort of how politics works and how global policy and all of that might mm -hmm. might be made and, and and manufactured. And they have influence in some cases in those things but they're mostly completely unaware of the new commons and the generative commons that we're talking about. Uh, because books, if you buy the book story, books yep. are not in the commons. No. Right? Books are kind of carved out of the commons by book rights and book software and whatever else, which, which takes the ideas and says, nope, nope, still gotta protect these, <clears throat> um, which frustrates me. Um, and so, finding some new kinds of literacy that allow these folks to express things and put them in the generative commons uh, might be a great thing. And, and it can be as simple as recording a two minute video and putting it on YouTube with a, you know, the, the default creative commons kind of uh, uh, attribution or license that that's easy enough, but, yeah. but, and, and, and another piece of that gets done by mixing the older groups with younger groups. Yeah who are native in their, in their grasp of how to communicate in these ways, who may or may not be able to articulate about new commons and what you know, generative commons might mean, but certainly know that they can find a lot of stuff and link to it and play with it yep. and, and make their own. And, yep. they feel, and they feel a lot of sense of uh, agency and power in making media. That's, that yep. just com comes with the territory of growing up where, with Instagram and, and, and YouTube and whatnots, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so uh, when I see like really brilliant groups and all they do is produce a book or a report, I just get angry because, yeah. because they're not digestible enough. They're not, they're not useful enough. They're not usable enough. Uh, even, you know, even a good report should, should openly publish all of its underlying data in some database so that other people can go run analyses and do whatever. Uh, that should be just a standard but it's not often, right? Yeah. So how do we make these entities more productive, more accessible, more usable, more visible by changing some of these aspects of how, of the, how they work? Yeah. 
Yep, exactly. Um, I now I met online and, and spoke several times uh, just before just before uh, actually meeting you, Jerry, with Ward Cunningham. And he showed me the, the rudiments of how to use a federated wiki. Yep. And I tried with two colleagues here in the Netherlands a couple of times to develop some skills. And I don't know if it's the best thing out there. It, it seems a bit clumsy for what I know uh, Stacey likes to call the muggles among us, like me. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, from him. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, a federated wiki. And I yesterday, when when uh, David Bowville was was in the chat, I, I went to his federated wiki pages, and I saw, oh yeah, that's right, this Gardens of Knowledge that was really inspiring and such, but. I'm wondering, because I mean, I, I, I think it's a way to use the uh, intelligence of the and skills of the people in open global minds to, to make some prototypes that might work easier than federated wikis or whatever else is out there. Um, yeah, and so here's a link the, to David Bovell's Democracy Garden, FedWiki, yeah. using that's, FedWiki. It's was, really inspiring, yeah. Stacy, so you can look around. And, and yeah. David, David has done a whole bunch of work around this. So a lot of the liquid democracy stuff that was happening in Germany, he was deeply involved in. He's been thinking really hard about all this stuff and, and I think is, is sort of peacefully frustrated um, in trying to fund, you know, he's busy applying for grants to get some funding to move forward his batch of ideas. Um, and I find, and, and Ward Cunningham is a neighbor here in Portland. Um, yeah. I've, had, I've had lunch with him a couple of times. Uh, I, I don't really like FedWiki because I don't really understand how to live in FedWiki. I, I, it, yeah. it, it, it keeps open, opening these vertical windows and I don't understand how I'm moving around it. Same thing happened to yeah. me for TiddlyWiki. I was using Tiddly for a while. Um, uh, Stacy TiddlyWiki is a local on your computer wiki. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, so basically you can run TiddlyWiki without having an internet connection and you can basically build a little wiki for yourself, but Tiddly is like a single page wiki in some sense. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's one of many different wiki variants that exist. Um, and the FedWiki is interesting because of its very highly decentralized model for yep. um, copying pages. Uh, so if I wanted to edit, Stacey, if you had created a page on, on, on your FedWiki about uh, David Bauville, and I wanted to edit or comment on it, it would make a copy of that of your page in my FedWiki and then yep. leave a link on yours over to me. But, but I don't actually know how the changes would be synchronized or moved. I, I have no useful mental model of how that actually functions, <clears throat> but it's highly decentralized because there's lots of copies being made on the fly of every What's page that that FedWiki. That's uh, the smallest federated wiki or FedWiki. <clears throat> um, and so th those things don't really work for me. And and one of the things that's fun about Pete Kaminsky's efforts on Massive Wiki is that he's had lots of Wiki experience. He's friends with Ward as well. Yep. Uh, he was the co-founder of Social Text, which was, was selling Wiki services to corporations back in the day. It eventually got bought and went away. Uh, I was on the advisory board for, for Social Text alongside Ward Cunningham. Uh, so we had advisory calls you know, for, to help them try to sell this thing because corporations were just having a hard time understanding how to think wickily and how to work wickily, right? Which means kind of working in the open. Um, and, and, and again, there's a piece of, when I said earlier, wouldn't it be great if people just understood that we're like interdependent on this little you know, fragile rock together that would change things around a lot. Yep. And one of the things that, that lets you turn on that light bulb is working wickily when, when, you, when your ideas are open and other people can go and prove them, connect to them, do other kinds of things. And then I, just, I, had a, I had a conversation with Pete yesterday where I said, so Pete, um, technically speaking, a wiki is a wiki because you, people can edit it right there on the face and, social, and with a massive wiki, you can't do that yet. There's no, there's no pretty front end where I can just click on something and, and start editing yeah. the page and save it again. I have to run over to a, a tool like Obsidian or HackMD, <clears throat> learn how to use GitHub properly, blah, 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 you know, swing a dead cat overhead three times while I'm saying the Harry Potter chant 
uh, the Harry Potter spell that, that actually saves pages on GitHub. <clears throat> and then we're good. And he's like, he, he was laughing. He's like, yeah, I know. And, and so part of what I'm trying to figure out is how can we fund as a project a useful front end for massive that is open that does kind of what you're saying, Hank, that makes it yeah. easy and accessible for, for, for other people. Because, you know, uh, the Wikipedia is built using the Wikimedia platform, which is a wiki as well. It's probably the most used wiki in the, on, on the planet. And it's not that simple to use. And yeah. it's, it's now gotten kind of complicated. Um, it's, it's good, but it's not great. Oh, if it were great, it would have replaced Google Docs, for example. Yep. Hey, Michael, yep. thanks for joining us. Sure. Um, I'm sorry for being so late. I just uh, figured I'd, I'd drop in for what it's worth. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We've had a wandering conversation through a, a bunch of different things from how Indigenous people uh, took care of the landscape around the world to, <clears throat> to the, how wikis work and what, what that, that's where we are now. And, how to think together basically using these tools and a bunch of other stops in between. Um, and just a ahead. reaction to, to what was just being said, um, I, was, I was gonna type into the chat um, where, um, <coughs> sorry, Hank, you typed uh, just your note, how to fund a yeah. useful front end for massive, um, you know, how to fund a useful front end for massive and anything else that can interoperate with that, that should interoperate with that so that if you learn to use one of the tools, well, it shouldn't take much learning, but you know, if you can use one of the tools, then you can use Massive and you can use you know, Trove and Factor and, and you, know, you name it. Yep. Um, but they're all, they don't have different um, front ends. I mean, they have different front ends, but they don't have different input uh, modes. Right, mm -hmm. and they're sharing and they're sharing data given access privileges. Um, totally want that world. To use? <laughs> All right. What's well, that? Go ahead, Michael. I was just asking what Hank just said. Oh, is it easy to use? That that interface that we're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, it, uh, and actually, you know, there's lots of things that I would dream about are being able to share views on the same data that everybody has like access to their own data and then the ability to look at it, you know, how does it, how does it look in Massive Wiki? How does it look in Trove? How does it look on Facebook? How does it look, you know, in Dropbox as a just a file structure yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in the brain, that would be great. But I wasn't even thinking about that that you know backend dream. I was just thinking about like you know if if we're using markup or if we're using the ability to select and make something bold, you know, with a keystroke, whatever it is that that very very simple input mechanism is as as friendly and same as you know i mean basically if you think about twitter and facebook and instagram and and all those things they they share input simplicity and yeah. virtually share the same capabilities mm -hmm. yeah. and it just seems like you know an interoperable um you know information sharing network should be as easy as that to yeah. you know have that that shallow a learning curve yeah and um and you know be if there if there's anything more difficult about it than that um it should be common to the platforms that use it and yeah. everyone should be invited yep 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 easy to say yeah well, so and not hard to do but just hard to disseminate and agree on. Yeah, uh, the light bulb that went off in my he <clears throat> head some years ago was um, that if we see that tools like email and web builders and whatever, if we see that they're all starting to use variants of HTML and we think of HTML kind of as the lingua franca of documents, 
then the only difference between a website and an email is that one of them says, where do I put this? And it's given a URL and it's, it stores it on the files that respond to that URL. And the other one is like, well, who do I send this to? And it's given an email address. And there's another system called SMTP and POP and all that stuff, sort of stuff that knows how to deliver this package to HTML to some other person. But the body of the message doesn't need to be different in pretty much any other way. Like, and, and then I was like, oh crap, okay. So, so all these things are actually much more similar than we think they are. Um, what we need to do is create an environment where it's easy to promote and demote things so that, uh, so that we can then just write to whatever thing we want. It's a much simpler way of thinking about how documents live. Well, I would go a little further and just say that if you think about email um, as you know, something that you own your own end of um, every email you've ever sent or received. Mm -hmm. And if you save it and archive it and organize it, um, you don't even need to be connected to the web to experience it. And mm -hmm. if you were willing to share access to some of those things and not other, the, other of those things and make some of those things public um, that they could still live on your you know, hard drive, server, whatever. They don't have to be in the cloud um, if there were a way, an interoperable way to say, here's the stuff I have, here's the stuff I'm willing to make public, here's the stuff I'm willing to make public to these four of us because it relates to what we're um, yeah, yeah, yeah. talking about and that kind of you know simple standard of of interoperability access is is it's similar to what we have for texts and not incredibly dissimilar to what we have for email and uh, you know I am not technical but <laughs> <laughs> but I know that would not be that hard. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, yeah. and so an architecture for email that might've existed, but didn't, because it's really kind of cumbersome, but now we can kind of maybe waste cycles on it. But imagine if email was just a bunch of files on my directory and I would give, when I, when I sent you an email, I would be giving you permission to read the document that's in my directory. And as you made your way down through your stack of emails in your inbox, each of them would be taking you to somebody else's directory where you're reading a web page, basically. That's my message to you. And that's not, a, not at all how email works. We're busy like sending these little puppies all around the world. Yes, Stacey. Then what would happen if for whatever reason you decided to take it down? If you decided to remove your emails from the world, you could then do that because you would have kind of Access, they would be like files only on your system and you would have access rights to remove them. And no, but other, I'm thinking about the other person that was counting on having your location for that bit of information. So there's a couple layers to this. One of them is the world I'm describing is not a world I would like because I, oh, okay. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't want people to be able to like remove all their emails and have them be okay. gone. And then there's lots of ways in which you could replicate or make redundant or just in a, share in a distributed way those files. So uh, I say the, the radical uh, piece of it is all those files are on my hard drive on this little computer that I'm using right now. And that's the only place those files exist. Another way is my emails live on IPFS, the interplanetary file system, which basically um, takes any file, splits it up into pieces, sends out those pieces to everybody who's cooperatively storing these things so that nobody holding the pieces knows what the message says and only I can reconstruct the message, but um, the message is redundantly saved across the full network because it's been split up into lots of pieces and many people have many of the pieces, right? But, but the key to access it and reassemble it and open it is just mine or, and, and whoever's I give permission to. So in that world, <clears throat> I still have some kind of virtual control over the file, but the file is no longer just on my device, but rather you know, spread across uh, lots of people's devices on this distributed file system now. And one of the things we're, we're trying to figure out is um, where uh, IPFS, uh, interplanetary file system, 
and um, is, is that is that your coinage or is no that... no no there there actually is a thing called IPFS it's been around for a long time there's also okay. something called IPLD or IP linked data which is really interesting which I know nothing about I am totally an amateur here it's... but these but these are actually interesting architectural components for our future work yeah 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 is it and, uh, I'm sorry just out of curiosity it's interplanetary or intraplanetary or interplanetary it's just a it's a cute thing okay all right presupposing presupposing that uh, there are others in on the standard um, yeah on other worlds and um, it, and it's in a lot of use like it's uh mm -hmm. this this is a popular platform that actually works as opposed to other things out there what one thing that strikes me in you know getting back to what stacy was asking when you think about like somebody who creates a website and other people <coughs> put comments on it or interact with it and then that person takes the website down it's you know it's gone like that and that's their their right to do and you sort of know you're taking that risk when you post stuff that lives on their website um but if we were talking about individual, you know, files that um, you commented on, that they might put up as, as going back to the email example, an email is a sharing of a file. And then the responses to that sharing of that file um, by whoever has access to it, you know, I, this, this is the way of dealing it with it with, without going to IPFS and the uh, kind of fractionalizing, which sounds a little, a little blockchain-ish on us. Um, it's, it's not the blockchain at all because it doesn't I mean, have all the, it doesn't have the proof of work. It doesn't have all that other stuff right, at right. all. Right, yeah. But I mean, it, it's, a, it's a standard that involves- um, Cooperation uh, among many devices. Cooperation among any devices and a sort of um, useless shard being the thing that makes cooperation necessary. Like if one person only has a piece of it. But um, in the case of this kind of email like file sharing that I'm imagining and, and would think of as an ans answer to Stacy's point, if I create a file and share it with you, you three and, um, and you all comment on it and, and but the, the, all four of us have a copy of that complete file. I can delete it. You guys still have it. And mm -hmm. by originally choosing to share it with you or give you access, I mean, it would be good if the access could somehow be made a permanent state. So you, one of you couldn't decide, oh, I'm gonna make this public to everybody. Um, but you know, there's, a, there's a consensual act there with some, some boundaries around it. And, right. and keeps us each safe from the other blowing it up. Um, and I think what you're just describing right now is the FedWiki architecture. <clears throat> I think that's the intention mm -hmm. of FedWiki is that there, there's, that's why it's always making copies of each page and putting them on your own FedWiki is that, is that hey, um, that's, how, that's how it preserves kind of larger system yeah. level integrity or, some, or access or something. I'm, and yeah. I'm not sure, yeah, yeah. I, ju I just have no useful mental model for how that works and how to use it properly and, and what it means. Yeah. I mean, it can be as simple as structurally as, um, and, and this was honestly, you know, factors as, aspiration, but if you think about say Dropbox, um, if you put, if you were to choose to put everything you ever see, every bit of information that you gather you know in your dropbox and then make certain folders shared and certain folders private and certain folders public that that keeps your access to everything um and gives you the the power to to share what you want to share um and and let people edit what you want to let them edit um yeah hmm. interesting mm -hmm. Stacey, you wanted to jump in? Yeah, I had like another question. It's sort of like an imagineering question regarding what you were what you were saying, Jerry, about um, 
this idea that you'd send something out, everybody would have a piece of it, you would only have the key. So because I don't know how that works, theoretically, if all the other people, if all the other locations work together, would they be able to guess the key? In principle, they shouldn't be able to because the key is a cryptologically secure, unique thing, which is as good as the key cracking technology of the time. So okay. given enough compute power, most passwords are crackable. Like you, you can sort of brute force your way through, but, <clears throat> but some of these passwords are permutationally crazy. Like <clears throat> you'd have to be pretty smart to sort of figure out how. So problem, if it was technically well-built, then technically no. You could have all the you could have all the shards, but not the key, to decrypt it and reassemble it properly, and and you still wouldn't be able to make sense out of it. At least, in principle, I'm definitely. Well, no, I was no, I was thinking about a hundred thousand people getting together and cracking a code. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was well, just curious. there's certainly a lot of people trying to do that, and there's there's new technology like quantum computing that suddenly releases a tremendous amounts of new compute power, which are very useful for things like password cracking. Yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, so, so, so these, so things we think of as, as secure today because we used X kind of difficult password, that threshold keeps getting further and further out as yeah. we get better and better technology to crack, to crack passwords. <laughs> which also means that older files that we think are protected may in fact become unprotected pretty quickly. Yeah, I was just visualizing it like a piece of a puzzle. And I was thinking the more pieces you have, the easier it is to find the missing one. Um, yes, Un unless the missing one is, is just different from all the other pieces because it's the, it's the key and it's not a piece of window or wall or flooring. Got it. Um, I guess, yeah. Um, Cool. Any, uh, we're sort of at our time. Any, anything else anybody wants to put into the conversation or to think about? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. I'll go back to uh, my earlier comment, I think just before Michael joined, about uh, the four groups that I'm involved with and putting something to each of those groups. And one of the groups would be OGM another group, World Federation of Future Studies, third one is the New Club of Paris, fourth one is European Network of Living Labs. They all are representing uh, distributed collective intelligence, which could be leveraged for doing something to benefit larger society, like uh, cracking a, a, a really difficult puzzle with one of the uh, the UN's uh, sustainable development goals, just, just as an example. I would like somehow to convince three of those groups to do something next year. Taking something you said when I mentioned that, Jerry, which was because of the tech capacities of OGM, uh, we could perhaps create the technology for it. And that's how we got to the, this, this discussion of uh, Massive and, and, uh, and uh, Google uh, Docs and mm -hmm. uh, Dropbox and uh, a number of the things that weren't mentioned, but the things I really liked which was what Michael said, uh, creating something with input simplicity and a shallow learning curve, like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. How to propose, how to work that up into a type of proposal and where to propose it to OGM? Mm -hmm. Because um, all those other organizations or, or, or groups have their own way of doing it. And right. part, of, part of what I'd like to propose is that if three of them do it, they pool their, their knowledge and, and, and what they learned and, and such so that they will, everyone benefits. Right. So a couple of things have come to mind. Uh, one, I think we would be easy to convince because we have special magic access to, to our organization. Um, and 
if we could describe it. So this is a very OGME project, like, you know, uh, doing this would, would serve really well our, our kind of purpose on Earth. And if we frame this properly, it could also be a project that I'm trying to find funding for myself. So, oh, yeah. uh, so you know, I, I would love to be able to put this on a dashboard and say, hey, we'd like to write something that does this. And here's the use case. And there's four organizations in the world that would use it if we built it. Yep. Uh, he, uh, Michael, oh, you weren't on the chat yet. Let me just copy and paste it because uh, before you got in, Hank pasted, posted boop, 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 this, which has acronyms uh, for a lot of them. Uh, so World Future Society Federation, for yeah, example. World Future w Studies Federation. Future Studies Federation, right. More than uh, 200 people around the world. Yep. New Club of Paris has 100 some odd people on all continents. Uh, which, which we have special access to as well, because it was started by Leif Edvinson, who... Yeah. Uh, and I'm involved. on the events commission as of uh, a month ago. And the <laughs> European Network of Living, and I'm also editor, of, of, of contributing editor of the online uh, WFSF uh, uh, Human Futures magazine, but that's a, that's a different conversation. And uh, the uh, European Network of Living Labs, I've done two presentations at their uh, digital Living Lab Days, which used to be a face-to-face -face Living Lab Days, but it's been digital for the last couple of years, about this topic. So the board of directors is enthusiastic, but there, there's 400 member organizations where it's hard to, they're underfunded and overworked. But anyway, I mean, all of these organizations know about this to some extent. The directors are interested, board of directors are interested, but their members organizations, just like the OGM is a kind of community and there's no board of directors or anything. So if it could be expert prototyped, I think at least these groups would like to use it. And I think there's probably a lot more in the world. Michael, you're gonna- um, I was just curious uh, to ask if you, Hank, are familiar with um, Futures Space, which is another um, European uh, futures group that has, has a large presence on factors. So that's why I know about them. They use it for um, horizon scanning and, and discussion. And uh, I'm, I'm very curious about the, the whole realm of, um, of futurism, fu futurology. <laughs> a lot of them call it futurism which, and, and call themselves futurists, which drives me nuts since that's an art me movement and it gets sort of <laughs> confusing, but, uh, but yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with them, but I've just opened their website. Looks is, really interesting. <laughs> is this them, Michael? Yeah, yeah. And, um, and Tan, uh, uh, Tanya is somebody we've told about, um, about OGM, uh, hoping she would come and join us both for mm -hmm. like, I mean, for her, for her lack of, uh, of, of middle age and uh, maleness, <laughs> um, <laughs> if nothing else. Man. <laughs> I'm sorry, but you know, God, these, <laughs> oh, and I'm being kind by saying middle age, you know. I know, yeah. I know. I have to I tell know. you, this is one of the better groups, is oh. as far as that goes. Well, Thank because you. we're we're one fourth female, um, but <laughs> we're, <Hey>. we're <laughs> no, I mean as a whole. I mean as, as a, a whole. Yeah. OGM? OGM as a whole. I've been to other places where. Okay. Whoa, yes, there are testosterone words. could knock you out. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know the the source of most world problems is TIMR. It's a testosterone induced mental retardation. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is an ancient, ancient bad joke. Like, uh, right. I don't think we talk use those terms anymore. But I like TIMR. Yeah. So um, that's Tanya Schindler. Mm-hmm. Because I've got it up now. Tanya Schindler and Graciela. Guadarrama Buena. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're 
a good bunch. Um, oh yeah, cool. And it'd be it would be fun to involve them in our attempts to build some infrastructure for sharing what we know. Yeah, and then. It would be really interesting for futurologists to start sharing out what you know their forecasts and whatever else on a common platform in some ways. I mean, there's a whole bunch of it. Is, I hadn't really thought about the. I collect futurists, so there's a whole bunch of them. <clears throat> um, um, but to involve some of them in in using open scaffolding for sharing their data out would be super interesting. And then if you think about Philip Tetlock and super forecasting. Um, He's really interesting in that he's talking about what is a good forecast. Like, you know, hey, this is going to happen is not a good forecast. But hey, uh, by this date, this number is going to be this number is a, is a, is a forecast you can actually check. Um, and so he's trying to figure out who, who among us are the super forecasters, which is a, a, an interest, a good and interesting question. Although once someone has been identified a, a brilliant super forecaster, whether that destroys their ability to do that, I don't know. But that's a question we would probably like to be facing. It would mean we would have found a few of these people, right? Yeah. Because I, I remember just, I'm always looking for when large events happen, like 9-11 or the global financial crisis or the insurrection, I'm always looking for who, <clears throat> who beforehand saw this coming yeah. and, had, and had a really good explanation. <clears throat> and what I'm describing actually is Michael Lewis's modus operandi. He just wrote a book, um, uh, Premonition, which is about who saw the pandemic coming. And he yeah. wrote The Big Short, which was about who saw the global financial yeah. crisis coming. And yeah. so his MO now is like, hey, major event, I'm going to go figure out, I'm going to go do a lot of research and hunt down the six people who, the six eccentrics who saw this coming and nobody was listening to them. And that makes for for good plots. Yeah. But But if we could, some of those people are actually super forecasters. And trying to understand how, how they thought or what they thought is really interesting. Yeah. And, it, and it, I love the big short, the movie and, and the book were both yeah. super interesting because yeah. one of those teams just went and started visiting homes. They started visiting neighborhoods and seeing that these homes were shut down and stripped and that people, that there was a balloon payment coming that nobody, nobody was going to be able to afford. And there, then they sat down with the loan originators who were like making mint. They were just taking lots of money home and we're perfectly happy to get people who had no collateral, no ability to pay to take out yet another mortgage. And they were like, yeah. oh, okay, this is completely broken. Uh, you know, and the, the question then is, when is it going to fail and how is it going to fail? And what is the proper hedge strategy so that you yeah. make money from the failure, which is a good cynical thing to be doing. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and in the big short, none of the people who win this game would ever want to replicate it afterward because all of their communities hated them. Their clients were like, you are insane. You are risking our, our futures and our company. This yep. is nuts. You shouldn't be doing this until the day when they were the only ones who had a good bet on what was actually happening. Anyway, long story. Anything else for where we are or shall we wrap the call? I'll go back to my island. <laughs> uh, Hank can go back to his lighthouse. Yeah, good idea. No, this this was a great call. Uh, I I love the fact that we can talk here. If it's only two people, three people, four people, five, six, and I get so much energy. Even though well, in Europe it's the end of the afternoon, but I come in tired and I go away energized. So that's yay! Really I love that. I love that. Yeah, and and whoever shows up is whoever was meant to be in that conversation. It's like, it's a, yeah. one of, the, one of the ground rules of open space is like, uh, you know, whoever is here is whoever was meant to be here and turn, it works out great actually. I guess yeah, it really it's tugs, it's, uh, something because somebody needed to, um, you know, ask, uh, ask Hank to put the link for the um, WFSF in the chat or maybe he already had. Yeah, I, I did. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yep. And yep. and it's federation. Not Needed foundation. to know. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So uh, that that's with web web links and and mm -hmm. yeah. oh let yeah. me just if I may just share one thing with you please which I got from one of my uh, LinkedIn feeds yesterday and let's see does this work 
Uh, how can I do this? Hmm. Um, can I put it in like this? Ah, I've got a photo on my screen. You should be able to screen share. Just screen oh, share. of course, it's, yes, yes, yes. If, yes, you, yes. If, you've, if you've opened it in preview or anything, you should be able yeah. to just hit screen oh, share yeah, and, sure. and show I'll, us what's uh, on your screen. Yeah, uh, screen share. Oh, there we go. Oh, yeah, yeah. That. <laughs> that's a good one yeah 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 I, just, I it's not apropos of the conversation but i shared it with a lot of people yesterday when someone shared it with me so i thought you you guys would enjoy it <laughs> yeah 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 made its way on facebook oh yeah yeah i'm sure i'm sure yeah okay thanks so much thank for you everybody thank you guys been fun